Hello, children. This is Miss Irene speaking to you from Atlanta, Georgia. Glad to be with you today. I know we're still shut in our homes, but we're not shut in our hearts. And the Lord, may He bless this lesson today to everyone who is listening. When I was in high school, some of my friends gave me a nickname. It was Charlie. It was taken from my first name that I'm not called by, but it was taken from Charlotte. And they liked to call me Charlie and the name stuck. Did you know that God has given us nicknames as well? Oh, there's many in the Bible. There's well over 200 nicknames that He calls us by. Of course, we won't cover all those today, but I'd like to spend the next two lessons sharing just a few of them. And why? Because in those names, God shows each one of us how much He loves us. Some of these names are going to be very strange to you, and you're going to wonder, how does that show God loves me? But by the time we finish today's lesson, you will start to realize how significant these names are, and that it's a privilege to be called by those names. The first two are found in Isaiah chapter 62, verses 4 and 12. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land any more be termed desolate. They shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you shall be called sought out, a city not forsaken. A city not forsaken. Strange nickname. In the past few months, many of the world's major cities look forsaken. You see deserted streets and closed up shops, all because of the coronavirus. Now it's going to change soon as the virus comes under control. You'll see people again, you'll see cars again. But let's look at a modern city that we can rightly term forsaken. Chernobyl was once a city of 50,000 people. It had schools, parks, theaters, homes, apartments, businesses, and also one of the largest nuclear power plants in the world. But in April 1986, several explosions occurred in one of her reactors, and it sent large amounts of radiation into the atmosphere. From 1986 through 2000, over 200,000 people were evacuated and resettled from the most severely contaminated areas of Belarus and the Ukraine in Russia. Now, scientists differ in opinion as to when the area will be safe to live in. Some say in a few decades it will be safe to resettle there, but others say not so, so quick, maybe several hundred years. So we say Chernobyl is certainly a city that's forsaken. It's a ghost town. A city not forsaken is actually referring to a city of Jerusalem. During King Solomon's time, the city was thriving. It was a joyful city, full of people, happy people. It was under God's blessing. But a few hundred years later, this city was destroyed by Babylonian invaders, and it remained desolate during the period of the Jewish captivity. Jerusalem is linked to the Jews, but it had become a city forsaken, uninhabited. We can only imagine how miserable God's people had become. They felt forsaken as they were taken a thousand miles from their home. They were slaves. They were separated from loved ones. They couldn't speak the Babylonian language. They had to eat strange food and were surrounded by Babylon's uh, idols, which were many. They were abused and tormented by their conquerors who said God had forsaken them. They had been warned by the prophets that this day would come, that their idolatry and their disobedience would bring God's judgment. 
but most weren't listening or taking the warning seriously. Now, God brought punishment, but He did not forsake them. In fact, they were sought out. Another nickname, the sought out ones. God never lost sight of His people. He never forgot them. That's why He calls them sought out, to remind them that He never forgets. At the appointed time, God rescued them and returned them to their land. How were we a city forsaken? Before we accepted Christ as our Savior, our sins separated us from God. Like those ancient Israelites who were made slaves in Babylon, we were slaves to the devil. He had his grip on us. We had no hope of escape. Now God didn't abandon us. He sought us out. He rescued us from the devil and made us part of his family. We are not forsaken. We are sought out. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. God also calls us beloved. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, God calls his son beloved. In Colossians 3.12, He calls us, God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. The prefix be on the word loved, it means thoroughly, completely. We are thoroughly, completely loved. God has never stopped loving His people. He will never stop loving you. Discipline, He must, but abandon, Desert us? Never. Three nicknames. A city not forsaken, sought out, beloved of God. And we end with one more. You worm Jacob. Uh, what was that? That's a strange name. Worm? How did that get in there? That doesn't sound affectionate. He calls us worm. That can't be right. Fear not, you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. You know, the Bible lists many kinds of worms. There's the canker worm the scarlet worm, the intestinal worms, the palmer worm, and the earthworm. Perhaps he means this little worm, just this friendly little, everybody knows the little earthworm. Such a precious little creature. Maybe he was talking about that, the sweetness of good topsoil. Thanks to this little crit critter, <laughs> I don't mind holding him in the least. He does such good things for our gardens. It's not so bad being called a worm, even if it is among the lowest creatures in the animal kingdom. But is this the worm that God is referring to? Let's see what the Bible has to say. How can man be righteous before God? How can he who is born of a woman be clean? Behold, even the moon is not bright and the stars not clean in his sight. How much less man who is a maggot? Children, the worm here is Rima, the Hebrew term for maggot. When God says, you worm Jacob, he uses this term. He's referring to the common fly grub. Flies are attracted to things with strong, decaying smells, such as animal feces, poop. In fact, Flies can smell poop up to a half a mile away. 
that's almost a kilometer. To them, to a fly, the poop smells good. It smells delicious. So they lay their eggs on it. And the minute those eggs hatch, the larva actually begins to crawl to the smelliest part of the poop and begin feeding. And they'll feed 24-7 continuously, nonstop feeding on that stuff. So how? How is man? How are we like a maggot? In our fallen sinful state, we, re we prefer an environment to that that's similar to that of a maggot. The sinner is drawn to evil and the more vile the environment, the better he likes it. Everything the sinner does, every way he reacts, everything he desires is similar to the nature of a maggot. What can a maggot comprehend? What can he understand? He can't think for himself. He can't understand his condition or his surroundings. The maggot's nature will always take it to the place it's accustomed to. I'm going to repeat that. The maggot's nature will always take it to the place it's accustomed to. Even if it wanted to change its environment, it can't because it can't help itself. Neither can it defend itself. It doesn't have armor on it like a beetle to protect itself. It doesn't have wings where it could fly away like its parent, the fly, could fly away from danger. Its soft body can be trampled on. It can become food for every kind of predator. Even fishermen use it for bait. Well, the sinner is helpless too. He couldn't help himself if he tried. He's drawn into a vile kind of life. I just described the sweetness of healthy topsoil. Earthworms themselves don't have a smell. The smell of a maggot's environment makes us shriek back. We feel like vomiting. Only as we see what we really are before a holy God can we realize how deeply God loves us, how low He came to rescue us. Children, you have to take a good look at how God sees your sin. You cannot whitewash sin. You can't sweeten the term maggot. <laughs> Everyone knows what a maggot is. It is detestable. It stinks. It's filthy. It lives in dead things. Your reaction to maggots is God's reaction to your sin. Your sin has a smell. Isaiah 69 5 says it reaches God's nostrils and sickens his spirit. <laughs> but there is good news. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, Christ is a sweet aroma to God. So when we have Christ in us, we are a sweet smell to God. God created a smelly, filthy little creature to help us understand why he loathes sin and why we must loathe sin, hate it. Some of us don't want to be reminded of what we are. Yet, to ignore this truth robs us of the deeper revelation of God's love. You worm Jacob, we are a maggot. There's no getting around that. We're a maggot. Yet in Psalm 135, 4, and Malachi chapter 1, verse 2, the Lord says, He loves and has chosen Jacob for himself. You worm Jacob, but it says God loved Jacob. Jacob was a liar. 
a deceiver, a sinner, and God loved him. Likewise, God loves us. He didn't find us on a bed of sweet smelling topsoil. He found us in the worst place imaginable. And he gave us a way out of our mess. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill. The dunghill, the poop pile where maggots live. It is when we understand the depth of our sinful nature that we can understand Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners, while we lived selfishly and wallowed in our stinky, putrid sins, Christ died for us. There is no greater love than that of a life purposely given to save another. And this is precisely what Christ did for us. In his great mercy, God reached down to the lowest of the low, to the sinner. When we repent, Christ puts his own nature in us and begins that blessed work of transforming our hearts to the likeness of himself. Four terms of affection. A city not forsaken, sought out, beloved of God, and yes, a maggot. Don't ever say, God doesn't love me. To the contrary, he went to hell and back, and he entered the kingdom of darkness to rescue you and redeem you. That's how much he loves you. You don't have to stay in the mire. You don't have to stay in the muck. He has called you to himself. He says, come up here. I want to share my goodness with you. Let's pray. Father, it is a privilege to share such words. Everything that you call us by is your precious way of letting us know that we are deeply, completely loved and that you will never abandon us or forsake us even when we still get caught up in the muck and mire of sin. But you've made a way for us to come up and out of that by the blessed death of your Son on the cross. It was the only way that we could be rescued off that poop pile, out of that smelly, filthy way of life, of thinking, of our very old nature that would bring us back again and again to that terrible place of darkness. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for rescuing us. Thank you for loving us so much that you didn't count your own life as too precious to come down to save us. Help each listener to understand better, to be more appreciative, to be more thankful, to bless your name for what you did for each of us. Help each heart to be encouraged that there's no place so low and they are never forgotten that you will not continually keep helping us and lifting us higher from what we have 
known. Thank you for the call on our hearts to know Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless each of you. And I pray that you keep walking and talking with Jesus. Thank you.